Hello, everybody. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. <laughs> Can't hear anything. No? All of a sudden. Uh oh. Did you turn your volume down for the music? <laughs> I hear you loud and clear, Rick. Yeah, I just heard a little, a little bit. Ah. I can hear you. I'm hearing people on and off. What are they having for the banquet tonight? Banquet. You don't know why. <laughs> Air burgers for the banquet. Oh, like Kim, has, Kim has a fire going. Oh. I do have it. Hi, Frank. Good to see you. Yeah, good to see you. Hey, Howard, good good thing you made it. Well, thank you. <laughs> All right. Glad to be here. It's a little oh. cold in Canada. <laughs> We're on the beach by uh, south of Tampa, and it's just really nice here. It's rainy, but it's warm. Okay. <laughs> I just come in from outside, walk with my dog, and then already I got to put my jacket. It's chilly up here already. Oh, my. Uh, I wish I was in Florida or oh, Arizona. Yeah, we'll take some of that rain. Our monsoon was a total bust this year. We had no measurable precipitation. Okay. Oh my gosh. Your three days of summer in Canada are over? Tucson, we're dry as a bone. You bet. Dot, you took your tie off. <laughs> now he's got to put a name tag on. <laughs> now, before I was on, before I actually had a one of my shows, so, so I just oh. come off doing a tour of the solar system. Uh, we voted you most overdressed for the conference. <laughs> I was so impressed I decided to dress up, so I took my hat off. <laughs> <laughs> Well, now, now I have to had, had to switch over to red and black because we got a uh, Auburn Georgia game here shortly. Uh. Looks good. We'll wait a few more minutes and we'll get started. I do not see Mr. Pochettley yet. Howard, 
do you observe the sun lately um, yet today or something? Well, uh, I didn't get to. It's uh, cloudy here and we've got rain coming down. Oh. And I'm going to be at the beach here now for a week. So it'll be next week before I can start observing again. But the rest of the year, I should be able to observe any day that it's clear. All right. Yeah. It's, well, I did go to the Solar Dynamics Observatory and there's that, pl that pledge is uh, pretty much at the um, limb and nothing much else going on. Yeah. That's not much uh, we've, we've been uh, fairly clear skies, but we've had so much smoke blowing in from the Western wildfires. Oh, yeah, a couple weeks ago. Mexico. Yeah. Why? In, in as far as New York, I, it was it was very hazy. I did the of crystal blue sky, and the sky was very hazy. Um, you know, the, the sky was milky white. And uh, I really can hardly see anything, even though the even though the sky was clear, but I can hardly see anything. Just a, just on just bright appointments. That's it. We uh, flew to Oregon two weeks ago, and less than halfway there from Florida, uh, we were flying over smoke from all those fires on the west coast. Right, yeah. It was bad. We sideslipped a couple of the major storms through here down in Louisiana here, but even with that, with all clouded skies being on the outer bands of it and stuff. We're lucky right now to get two nights, maybe out of the week, that it might be halfway clear enough to be able to see anything. Oh, wow. Really? We had nights really? here in Tucson where the observatories were closed because of smoke. Yeah, even um, even my Wilson, too, in California. Oh. In very close. Yeah, I hear they just barely saved that. Yeah. It's been absolutely totally horrendous up here because all that rain comes from down where you are, John Nagel. <laughs> yeah, we, we, we don't want it here. We're sending it up to y'all like that if there. Is, if it isn't a hurricane coming up the Atlantic coast, and it's coming in the Gulf of Mexico and the prevailing winds take it northeasterly and it either goes right above us, but we still get the clouds and the rain, a little bit of it, you get the worst of it. Yeah, well, we had two of them hit to the left of us and one to the right of us. We were caught on the edges, both the eastern edge or the western edge on it. So we managed to side slip uh, all the major storms so far this year. Well, this is a dinner meeting for the, that was it, Nostrovia. Yeah, in, in North Carolina, we, we got all your storms, John. <laughs> You're welcome to them. But, You're you know, welcome. But it was rain. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't as bad as... <laughs> Yeah, right. the hurricane, but it was uh, mm -hmm. uh, so most of the are summer. You, are you by the coast? Um, and are you by the coast of North Carolina? I am not, no, we're like about two, 200 miles inland. Um, okay. so there's only been like a couple of hurricanes that have come in that far, but mostly we get rain, mm -hmm. you know, and and uh, and storms and that kind of thing, but nothing, nothing hurricane ish. Um, you know, but yeah, yeah, the yeah. people on the coast they get. Sometimes they get hit pretty bad because North Carolina kind of like jets out, so we <laughs> hit it worse than the other than the other uh, uh, southeastern states, you know. So, well, above and beyond the storms and stuff, not being there only a couple of nights out of the week, maybe be able to have a clear enough sky. I've also been limited because I had a uh, disc between my C five and C six was replaced about a hundred days ago, and I was limited on what I could do for quite a while. And Rick Hill can talk. He had the back surgery, you had the neck surgery. I think uh, we're about to get started. Everybody ready? I'm good. Dinner. All right, we're, we're going to start off with an award. Um, the, uh, the Walter Haas Observers Award. Uh, the Walter Haas Observers Award is bestowed annually, usually at the meeting, uh, to an amateur astronomer for Excellence in Observational Solar System Astronomy. And this award is named for our founder. The original executive director was established in uh, 1985. The selection of this award is conducted by committee convened by its committee chairman, which uh, for the last few years has been me. And I also wanna thank the committee that uh, helped me this year. The co composition of the committee changes from year to year. So the responsibility of selecting is shared by a wider group of members. In the ALPO, they are well qualified and will allow others to vote one year. Others 
considered for the or considered for the award in another year while not serving on the committee. This award is given for excellence in solar system observational amateur astronomy. Work as done as a part of an observer's job must be regarded as professional work and is not considered as an amateur effort for this award. However, a professional astronomer can be recognized for work done when he or she is an amateur. This award consists of an engraved plaque and the awardee also receives two year complimentary membership to the ALPO. I am very pleased to announce this year's winner of the Walter Haas Observers Award, Howard Eskinen. Okay, I'm gonna give this to uh, Steve Zekas. Steve, would you hand it over to Kim Hay and then Kim can hand it over to Howard, right? <laughs> Howard is a highly competent and longtime solar and lunar observer with ALPO. He has sent nearly 5,000 observations of the sun to the ALPO solar section and has written a piece in sol on solar system or solar photography for their website. He also provided photos and written material for James L. Jenkins' book, The Sun and How to Observe It. He also observes the moon and submitted more than a thousand lunar photos to the Alpos lunar section. He's written articles for Sky and Telescope, The Australian Astronomer, Scenology, and The Lunar Observer. I'd like to welcome Howard Eskiden. Well, thank you. This is, this is something that hit me totally out of the blue. I had no inkling that I'd ever be given an award like this. Uh, and the only reason I can imagine that it would happen is because all the people that really deserved it were on the committee and couldn't nominate themselves. But thank you very much. I mean, there's several people that are attending tonight that have already uh, uh, earned this award. And I've respected them ever since I joined ALPO back, I think it was like 2003, if I remember right. Um, I grew up in Nebraska and on a farm. And the only thing in the sky at night was the stars. And so the Milky Way was like a big neon sign to me. I couldn't believe that there's people in this world that hadn't seen it. Uh, I'd always dreamed of having a telescope, but it was high school before I was able to resurrect a badly battered dinoscope. It was uh, four and a quarter inch and uh, res resurfaced the mirror and got it working. And then later on, I ground and polished a six inch uh, a reflector, which was very marginal. Let's just say I'm not a very good mirror grinder. But uh, later on, my wife got me a, a ETX 125, and I really got observing. But that was after a several decade hiatus because I made the mistake of going off to medical school, and my profession pretty much ate up my astronomy time until recently. But um, in 2003 or four, I had the good fortune of meeting Jose Oliveras, who was had a presentation at one of the local uh, science meetings, and he said, "If anybody is interested, I observe almost every night. Here's my address. I think, are you?" serious because I'm going to be there. So we spent a lot of time observing together and he was really a great mentor. Uh, gave me a lot of inspiration and uh, got me interested in the moon and the sun. And uh, since that time, currently I observe um, the sun in three bands, H alpha, white light, and uh, calcium K. And I do a lot of moon work. Moon work. I, most of my moon work had been done before with a six inch refractor, but then I graduated to a Celestron C9.5 which is about the limit for my observing conditions because I have to move all over the yard and I have to have something that's mobile for my observing sessions. But I hope to keep observing the moon and I'm really getting interested in the banded crater program. Uh, I'd sent about 500 observations of that in earlier and then I kind of gave it up, but now I see some use for it. I think I'm gonna expand on that. And as solar, I wanna to continue to observe in all three bands. Uh, I'm 69 years old. I'm sure I'm almost certain with my family history, I can make it through cycle 25 uh, and I'm hoping <laughs> to get a good share of cycle 26 before I have to call it a day. But thank you so much. It's an honor to be a part of Alpo. And I just, I, I'm just in shock and awe that I, you gave me this award. It, it just means the world to me. Thank you so much. Well, congratulations. Thank you. Hey, uh, Howard, you're from yes. Nebraska. You're from Nebraska? Yes, I grew up in central Nebraska. Can you really see the Rockies from Nebraska? It's so flat. No, you can't. Um, we would drive, when I was a kid, I dreamed of living in Colorado. And we, once or twice a year, we'd drive and we'd get to Brule, Nebraska, and we'd get into eastern Colorado before we could see the front range with Long's Peak sticking up and Mount Meeker sticking up in the distance. And I just, I thought that wow. was heaven and earth. Wow. Congratulations. Thank you so much. It means a lot. 
Well deserved. Are, are you two, um, you two have family stay in Nebraska or, or what? Uh, um, my okay. parents moved to Washington State, and I ended up moving there for a while um, later on. And I, I have some cousins that are still in Nebraska. Okay. I had an uncle that moved to Kansas, and he was a uh, botanist. And his name was Howard. He had a PhD, and I had an MD degree. And so we, he referred to us as the two Dr. Howards. He uh, was a World War II vet, but he survived World War II, and he died three weeks short of 100 years old. So that's kind of our family history. So I'm optimistic I'll be able to continue to deserve for a while. Oh, there you go. You know what PhD used to stand for? Piled higher and deeper? Piled higher and deeper. Yeah, MD is just much deeper. It's not quite as, it doesn't rate the PhD. All right, on that note, <laughs> I'm going to hold off on the uh, door prizes until after our keynote speaker. So with that, I'd like to introduce uh, a very special guest with us tonight. I was very lucky to have her on the Observer's Notebook podcast. We had a wonderful conversation. Uh, friend Vera Hyseni. Ms. Hyseni is currently pursuing her master's degree in planetary science at the University of California out here in beautiful California in Santa Cruz. I want to hear about your apartment hunting. <laughs> and is the founder and director of astronomy outreach in Kosovo. Ms. Hyseni is de dedicated to rebuilding her home country through the stars along with her organization's team consisting of 200 volunteers. Ms. Hyseni was recently was selected as one of the most five influential women in Kosovo and was recognized as a distinguished student by the Municipality Assembly of Kuftri. I hope I said that right. Besides working towards attaining her master's degree, her current effort is to develop the first observatory and planetarium in Kosovo. She's been honored by the IIU and the Minor Planet Center with the name of an asteroid, 45678 Pranvera Hyseni. The Municipal Assembly of Kosovo named her a distinguished student, and she was also honored with the 24 Under 24 Award by the Mars Generation as a leader in STEM education. She received the Master Outreach Award in 2019 from the Astronomical League. It was named a SLU uh, Space Ambassador by the Robotic Teles uh, Telescope Service SLU. She will be talking about the efforts in changing the norms of the Kosovo society with regard to improving scientific literacy, inspiring the next generation workforce to pursue STEM careers, inspiring girls and women around the world to make their contributions towards science. She'll be highlighting some of her achievements that they have accomplished during the last decade and her involvements in searching for minor planets and development of the first observatory in Kosovo. My pleasure to introduce to you, uh, Pranvina. Hi, everyone. Um, it's my pleasure to be here. Uh, thank you very much, Tim, and thank you, Ken, for inviting me to be here. I hope you can hear me uh, clear. OK, great. Uh, so um, I'm very uh, honored to be among you guys. I've been hearing all of your presentations and uh, it's really inspiring and I learn a lot uh, from all of you. And uh, I'm very happy to be actually here in the United States currently. I just came in like a month ago, but I've been coming to America quite frequently in the last few years. And now I just started school. Actually, I had my first class two days ago, and I'm very excited about that. Uh, so I'm going, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here. Okay, and probably you can all see my screen now. So I am actually from the Republic of Kosovo, and I put a map in there just so uh, if any of you doesn't know where Kosovo is, because it's quite a small country, and it's actually the youngest country in Europe. And um, in fact, uh, in my country, we have had quite a uh, bad past because uh, we have been um, going through a lot of things, uh, including the war 20 years ago when I was only five years old. So as you can see here in the, in the borders, we're uh, with Albania, Macedonia, Montenegro, and Serbia. So there was a conflict in the late 19s 
uh, with the Serbia and uh, it, it actually was very bad and we lost a lot of people. I also lost my grandfather during the war and I remember a lot of scenarios even though I was a kid so it was really bad but before that Kosovo was actually occupied by the Serbia. So um, we in Kosovo, we are actually Albanians. We long ago were part of Albania. And if we wanted to actually have things in our language, which is Albanian, it was quite hard. For example, if somebody wanted to study or go to school or something, it wasn't very easy because you couldn't actually study or do anything in our language. You couldn't read books in our language. And that was very bad. And my father is a teacher. He has been teaching for over 40 years. And um, not every time he could actually teach because sometimes uh, we were not allowed to teach in our own language. And it was very difficult. Like people of that time had to actually hide in houses and privately try to learn about science or learn how to write and how to read and all that kind of stuff it was not that you just wake up in the morning and go to school like in the normal place but after the war occurred which um thanking europe and united states that actually stopped all that bad genocide and all that in fact, during that time, something spectacular also happened in the sky. So in the 1999, when the war was still not finished, there was a total solar eclipse going on. And I was only five years old, actually four years old. But I remember as a kid, I, I went outside and of course, we didn't have any telescopes or solar glasses, any of that. My grandfather took me and my family and we got a bucket filled with water and we were looking at the eclipse in the reflection of the sun and the water. And uh, maybe not the safest way, but it was just something that my grandfather wanted us to see and not to panic because there were people who never heard of a solar eclipse before. They were panicking, like, is it gonna be the end of the world? They couldn't understand this very normal phenomenon that happens over the years and we can all see that. But for me, it was very interesting as a kid to see something like this and to, to start thinking like what's out there and uh, what's surrounding us and learning about celestial phenomenons. And luckily I was born in a, in a village, in a farm. I lived there my whole life. I had very great access to the night sky as you can always see the Milky Way. It's really awesome. But something that we don't have is that, I mean, I hear all of you when you say, oh, I got inspired into astronomy because my parents took me to a star party or somebody got me a telescope you know for a birthday or i go to a nasa center anything like that but what if you're born into a country where you have nothing like that like astronomy doesn't even exist and that's my case because in kosovo you don't have a place where you can Did her video freeze? Yeah, I was just going to ask. Did she freeze yeah. for everybody else or yeah. just me? Yeah. I hope she wasn't silent. Yeah, she she froze, but but I'm not she I'm not to. so yeah. I think it was on her side. Yeah. Unfortunately. Uh oh. Come back. Yeah, it looks like she dropped off. Is she in Santa Cruz? Yeah.
with some of our Zoom meetings, the moderator has pre-made signs. <laughs> oh, you're frozen. I think Ken is, um, hopefully, I think he may be trying to reach her. I just yeah, sent her a text she, message. Yeah, she feels terrible. Um, she's <laughs> attempting to get back on now. Yeah, Maybe Tim it, needs to play some of his music. At work, we have Zoom bingo. Oh, here she is. She's back. Okay. Welcome back. I truly apologize. <laughs> the internet here is not so great. I'm uh, actually staying in a hotel. I'm going to go ahead and share the screen. I uh, once again apologize. So anyway, I uh, was here. Okay, just so I can make sure I can see the screen. So uh, when uh, I started doing all of this, like in astronomy and wanting to learn more, I didn't have all the opportunity that you would have here in America. Like you want to buy a telescope, you would just go to a Celestron store and get one, or it's so easy to have anything here, which is very different in Kosovo. And uh, when I started going in school, uh, of course, my favorite subject was all the time science. And then when we started to use internet, I opened a Facebook account and I wanted to talk to people that actually have the same love and desire. And uh, in fact, I couldn't speak very well English at like 10 years ago. Uh, I, I, can, I can't speak very well even now, but at least I improved it a little bit. And um, I met a guy uh, from a neighborhood country who said, hey, I would like to donate you a telescope, like a, a three inch telescope. And uh, that was actually my first telescope uh, back in my day when I was young. And this was really, really awesome because I never had a telescope. I mean, look at that, it's so simple, but I didn't even know how to use it, how to to look at things, how to coordinate it. And I didn't know anything about, you know, uh, what you can see, what you cannot. So anything that I was learning was new to me just then. But the coolest thing Oh no. Can you still hear me? Uh, yeah, you're, you're, yes, we can you're hear frozen you now. Though. Okay, great. So with this telescope, actually, I, uh, I took it to schools and other places. And I mean, believe it or not, we couldn't observe all the time. Sometimes it would just look at the telescope rather than looking from the telescope. But I had a small solar filter I was trying to share with students. And you can see everybody was so happy to see a telescope for the first time. I mean. When I got this first telescope, uh, people don't even know where to put their eye to look at it. So it was quite exciting. But since I was, uh, I was uh, having all these connections with people and then doing all these activities in schools and other places, I also founded the Astronomy Outreach of Kosovo, which was the first astronomy program in our country. Uh, we don't have an astronomy department. We don't have an observatory. We don't have any astronomy societies. So this was the first step 
for our country that we would be able to have as a first with that tiny telescope, believe it or not. But then meeting people online and talking to so many astronomers from all over the world, especially from the United States, I was able to have more telescopes donated to me. So uh, these are all the telescopes that were sent to me from uh, astronomers here in the United States and Australia, from Europe, everybody that wanted to actually contribute and to help to make our country and our organization better and share these with other people. So the next event that I was actually planning to do was another solar eclipse that was happening in our country right after I got these telescopes. And it was nice because some of these telescopes, you can see they are solar telescopes, hydrogen alpha, some are like calcium K and visible light. And then viewing a solar eclipse, it was really nice having these and like so many solar glasses also. So this was uh, my next event uh, in Pristina in the capital city where we had like thousands of people showing up to see the solar eclipse. And you can notice there are only three solar telescopes in here, very small ones. And it was so hard to manage because they were like so small and a lot of people and everybody wanted to see. And of course the eclipse didn't last that long, but it was awesome to see how many people were actually interested to learn and to look at something like that. And we don't have this every day. Nobody comes to our country to, to get the telescopes out there and just you know show us the sky. It's not like here that everybody has a telescope in their balcony. And you know, it's like very common. So my organization and I, which now is consistent of 200 volunteers, most of them are like uh, young students, high school students, teachers, other participants from different backgrounds. And we go to schools all over Kosovo and also in Albania and Macedonia. And we take our telescopes, we observe uh, during the day, during the night, we do astronomy camps. We're just trying to, to, to make people understand that this is important and knowing what's out there, it's also really important in learning astronomy. Astronomy is something that we're part of it. We're part of this planet and we have to understand what's out there and where did we come from and why we're here, what's the purpose? And of course, it's very nice. And I, I know all of you are also involved in outreach when you just see all the joy that people get when they view through a telescope for the first time is really, really amazing. And then uh, the coolest part was that, you know, I was born in a country with not so many uh, access to science, no labs, no telescopes, but then I got the first invitation to actually go to a real star party. And uh, uh, Robert Reeves from the Texas Star Party invited me in 2017 to join the TSP in Fort Davis. I'm sure most of you probably have participated there. And it was incredible. You won't believe how excited I was going from a place where you don't have nothing in middle of somewhere where you have thousands of telescopes just lying out there in the fields. And I'm not talking about small telescopes, I'm talking about telescopes that are quite huge actually. And they also took me to the McDonald Observatory. So that was just, I was speechless, I couldn't believe. And uh, then, you know, from Texas Star Party, people were knowing that I'm in the United States and they know that I was so passionate about the science, but I didn't have the opportunity to actually about it to to have you know to observe from various telescopes to meet scientists and to learn about the science so everybody decided to take me somewhere and instead of spending only a week in the united states i ended up spending four months traveling to so many states it was awesome so i just put down some photos from different observatories i've been uh, i've been going uh, some of them, uh, this is, I think, in Arizona also, Mount Graham. Um, I was at uh, Lowell Observatory and I met Brian Skiff there. Um, 
Mount Wilson, I was also at Lick Observatory, Palomar, all the big observatories here in California. This is the Yerkes Observatory. And this one uh, is somewhere in Rhode Island, I think. I can't remember the name. It's just so many that I've been actually, it's hard to keep track. But this is my favorite one. And the reason is that from this observatory, which is Mount Lemon in Tucson, where is also the Catalina Sky Survey is based, uh, actually, you can see Eric and Dolores Health. They're also here in the Zoom chat. Uh, so I was uh, I was able to visit this. Rick Hill took me there and showed me all the observatories where they actually track asteroids and the way they discover all the minor planets. And I was so so excited because one thing that I actually am very interested in is in minor planets. And this is one of the reasons why I am here doing planetary science, because I want to study minor planets in my future. And I like to know about them, about their compositions, about their orbits, about, uh, you know, uh, future hazardous ones that could probably impact Earth and anything that actually has to do about it. And um, doing all of that, it's not so easy because if you really want to keep looking for new objects like that, you also have to have the equipment. So uh, doing this from Kosovo, it's quite impossible now, at least. So I was able to do some of the work um, when I was meeting other friends. Um, I partnership with my friend Hab Griffin, who is in South Carolina, also my friend Cesar in uh, Argentina when I was there last year. And uh, I have other friends in Australia who do the same work. And it's amazing because from the telescopes that they have, which are not professional, they don't have to be giant telescope to look at these things. We are able to use softwares like Astrometrica and be able to track objects out there and do confirmation of them like if somebody have discovered something and they put the coordinates in the minor planet center then we're gonna be you know probably the the second people to see that new discovered object and confirm it and tell these folks that yeah this is something new and we're able to see it and it's in this position and it's awesome to be able to do that and one of the things that i was able to do actually uh with my friend Hap was confirmed this comet, which um, this year, which was very bright. This is Comet Atlas. And I was, I was so excited because when we looked at it, it was so dim and I never actually expected that this is gonna be so bright that people are even gonna be able to go out there and see it from their backyards. It was really awesome. And uh, you know, my friend Hap and I are uh, some, you know, one of the confirmers for this comet. Um, other things I like to do is, um, you know, look at, uh, actually this was an animation, but since I am not sharing the screen, I don't wanna lose you guys. Uh, you can't see the objects moving, but these are some of the animations and photographs I was able to take from the SLU platform. So since I'm all the time on the move, you know, traveling, cause I travel all over the place and, I try to visit observatories and all that and do outreach at the same time. So having telescopes with me all the time, it's impossible. And one of the ways I was trying to access the sky was using the SLU platform, which is a great platform. Of course, you have to pay a fee, but it's not terribly expensive, especially for students. It's also very cheap. Uh, you can access telescopes and they are located in Canary Islands and also in Chile. So the good thing about this is you can observe both hemispheres. You have access to the sky and you have good telescope. They have a half meter telescope. They have two 17 inch, two 14 inch, and you can choose from any of the telescope you want to see. And what do you want to see? You can choose anything. So I wanted to observe some minor planets, but you can also look at so many things. Actually, these are some of my own photographs that I took from SLU telescopes. Uh, it's amazing. And to be honest, I haven't even processed these photos. They're all single shots from the telescope. I haven't stacked them. I haven't done anything with that because I am not big into astrophotography. I didn't know to use all of that. but just so if you want to share something with other people and say, hey, 
this is what you can see from a telescope because people don't even know that such a thing exists out there in the sky. And, you know, they will hold on for a second and look at that. They won't believe what they're seeing because they have never seen that in their life. And the only thing that you can see this with Hubble Space Telescope, it's not true because you can see those, some of them also with binoculars. You just have to find them. And then of course, my favorite lunar planet is this one, uh, the one that actually was named after me. Uh, I was nominated by Rick Hill. Again, I would like to thank him because this was a very, very great honor. I really like this asteroid. I've been observing it ever since. It's about, uh, I think it's eight miles in size. I mean, it's not known for sure. And um, it's, it's pretty bright right now. We can see it from a decent sized telescope, maybe a 10 inch or so. But it's nice to know that there is something out there in Hal's My Name, which is an Albanian name, and the kids that we have in our country are gonna grow up and they're gonna know that there is something out there in the sky that has our name on it. And they would want to observe it. They would want to learn about it. And this is what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to um, instill some interest to those children to love science. Not because that we're from a country that doesn't have the opportunity that should not stop us from looking at the sky or that should not stop us from wanting to know about science and about exploring and about studying anything we want. Yes, I came from that country. I started with a very small telescope, but right now I'm here in America and I'm I'm studying and I'm on my journey to become a planetary scientist because I wanted this and I worked for that. And I'm sure that everybody that follows their dream, I'm sure they're gonna achieve their goal. And I'm so, so thankful to all of these folks, all of you that have been supporting on my journey and on my work. And now one of the things that I want to do is, um, before I actually go ahead and that, I'll just share this one more screen. This is the Astronomy Outreach of Kosovo logo photographed in the International Space Station by a Russian cosmonaut. This was probably the coolest thing that's happened so far with our organization. I definitely love this. When I saw that I was speechless. I'm gonna stop the screen and I'm gonna share something else here. Where is it? I can't actually see that. Just give me a second. All right. Okay, that's what I wanted to share. So if, uh, I don't know if you're able to see that. So this is the next big step that we are actually wanting to do is uh, build a first observatory in our country. So we don't have an observatory. And um, here everybody has an observatory or even in other countries, like there are people who build one in their backyard just for fun and they have very nice equipment, but we don't have something like that in Kosovo and we want to build one. But the only way to build this is by um, having help and support from others. So I'm gonna play this video just so you can have a clue at what am I talking about. It is not a very big building, but it's supposed to have an observatory and also a planetarium that will go inside. We already have a 14 inch telescope that Celestron has donated and will be installed in this observatory once we build it. We only need the construction. Um, I would like to mention that you should probably ignore the dome here, which is a wedge shape because it's not gonna be like that. It will be a normal dome that opens and you can observe the sky, it's just that in this video, it was kind of impossible to put that. And also would like to mention that we have already the sound system and the projector for the planetarium donated by uh, Jack Dunn and Hap Griffin. And uh, we're actually trying to seek donations. And yeah, we'd just like to go down here and sh this is the telescope that was donated to us 
last year, but we have still not been able to uh, collect all the funds to make that building. And this is how it will look inside. This is the planetarium that will look inside. Um, there is also a hall that people can come and, you know, uh, hear lectures in astronomy and everything like that. I would also like to show the observatory. So the observatory is going to be two floor just so we can have better access to the sky. And of course, the base of the telescope, it's not going to be, uh, it's going to be sound isolated. So we don't get all the vibrations and all that. And of course, the dome is going to be to look like that, like the one that you're seeing here. So uh, one other thing I would like to mention, you will see this here, organizer, and then the beneficiary is James Weiner. And we did that because GoFundMe does not recognize our country and the only way to actually withdraw the money is having somebody here in America who has a social security number and is a trusted person and will withdraw the funds once they're all collected so it can bring it to Kosovo and we can uh, do the observatory. So James Weiner is an aerospace engineer, a very uh, big supporter to AOK and he's going to take care of that just so you don't get confused. And uh, definitely we would appreciate any uh, small donations that you're willing to make. Uh, of course, it doesn't only have to be monetary. We would appreciate any telescope, any computer, anything that could go in that building pretty much. We're trying to give some hope to these folks over there, to those kids, to tell them that we will have a center where they can go learn, they can go observe, and they can just have something to learn from and not to start from zero like I started. And it was quite a hard journey, to be honest. But um, here we are. And I would like to thank you for your time. Again, sorry, this has to be virtual. It's not as fun probably as in person and the connection and all of that. But I'm not going to take more of your time. Please feel free to ask any questions. Thank you again. Brand. How big is Kosovo compared to any of the United States or a group of a few of the states? As far well, as probably as big as Rhode Island, probably. Rhode Island is very small. You mean that's as big as Kosovo? I think so. And uh, we are only 1.8 million people. Oh, wow. So you can uh, compare it to an average city of America. Now, I print, when you can, what, what, when, oh, go ahead. Rick? I plotted it on a map of Arizona, and it's about the size of Pima County, where Tucson resides. Wow. Now, Pran, Pran when, you, when you came on the podcast, you talked about the government of Kosovo was funding part of this. What's happened with that? Yes. So last year, we actually got authorizations from the Parliament of Kosovo uh that we can build the observatory and they were going to fully finance it but then uh politics changed in our country so we got like new government new prime minister new everything and uh they basically never released the money and that was very disappointing but uh despite the protests and everything that we have done for this observatory uh we you know the, we couldn't actually withdraw the funds so the only opportunity, the only way to make this happen is by going with private donations. Okay. You have, uh, where, where is it located in Kosovo? Are you like near a capital city or are you? Yes, I also forgot to mention that the location for the observatory also was donated by a professor oh. of astronomy. So we already have the, uh, the location. We also have the road construction, which is by the K4 troops that are in Kosovo. They invested and also regulated the infrastructure. And we're also having some support by the municipality of the city where we're gonna build. So this thing is not gonna be too far from the capital city and not too far from 
other cities also. We're not building this like in the highest mountain of Kosovo because this is going to be kind of a science center, like a small science center. We don't want to have this so far away where people will not be able to come and observe. So we want to leave it somewhere where we have dark skies, but at the same time where, uh, you know, it's going to be close to everybody so schools can come with their teachers and students and participates in events like that so we just want to have an easy access for everyone and i think it's a great location that we actually chose but there you mentioned the politics can be a problem we've seen time and time again here over the long run in various countries where things start off and then the government steps in and nationalizes do you have any i mean do you have any fears that after your facility might be uh, finally successfully established, that it might have uh, a problem with a new government? Actually, that is not going to be an issue because the uh, property is uh, located to uh, a place that belongs to the organization. So that's private property now and belongs to our organization. So government cannot actually decide anymore that what can be built in that property or not. It's us who decide uh, if we can build there or not. So the rules in Kosovo about building things are a little bit different than here in the United States. Because our uh, I when I moved here, I was actually... Uh, buying a new house and then or renting something. So I, I, I spent a month trying to figure out everything. So restrictions were a lot different, but in Kosovo, it's much easier. Uh, we just uh, are waiting, you know, to get all the funds and start with the building as soon as possible. We are so fortunate to have you speak to us. And you've been to the Texas Star Party. What was it, the Nebraska Star Party? You've been all over. You, you. Yeah, I was actually to wow. so many places. I didn't show all the images. I was at the Texas Star Party, to the Grand Canyon Star Party, also in Nebraska, and um, also I spoke at Neve in New York, and it was great to meet all the astronomers because we're all connected on social media, but meeting in person it's something else. So I'm always uh, happy to meet everyone. Vera, you're such you're such an inspirational leader. Where do you see yourself being? Where would you like to be in ten or fifteen years? Maybe um, being in an observatory, um, kind of hunting for near Earth objects, something like that. <laughs> Keep them away. That's right. <laughs> uh, at the planetarium. Um, that's under the construction there. Um, is this away from the city lights or is it in a rural area in the country? Yes, it's actually in a rural area. That's why we chose that spot because we have great night skies in there, but it's also not far away from the uh, where people live. So they mm -hmm. can come and because uh, we don't have large cities that are really bright with lights. So uh, we have very good skies for the moment in Kosovo. I hope it won't get worse, you know, in a few decades, but uh, we're definitely uh, liking that place. So that's why we decided to build it there. Mm -hmm. So Walmart moves in, there goes the neighborhood. <laughs> if anybody wants to donate, tell us again, it's a GoFundMe account and what should they look for when they go to a GoFundMe? And she put it in the chat, so the link is right there in the chat. Okay. Yeah, or if you go to the GoFundMe, you can just write Kosovo Observatory, and it will pop up, and you can see the link. So So how do you like Santa Cruz? Uh, actually, Santa Cruz is great, but I'm not going to live in Santa Cruz. I'm currently in Mountain View waiting until the new house is going to be manufactured and I'm going to be living in San Jose and then commuting to the university. Although right now everything is online lectures, so I don't have to commute probably for the first academic year. But it's definitely awesome here. I love it. Yeah, living uh, in California, college. you have to get used to commuting. Uh, <laughs> yeah. A college life. Now you just came, you were stuck in Australia during COVID or? 
Uh, yes, I was conducting a trip around the world. So I was in, I started here in the United States and I went to Southeast Asia and I met with some astronomers there in Thailand. And then I went to Malaysia, Brunei and Cambodia. And then I went to Australia when all the COVID thing happened and I was stranded for five months. And just then I came here in the United States. So I was unable to go home because my country closed the borders and I was unable to return back there. So I have not been home for almost a year oh. and I miss my family, but I'm hoping to go back there by the end of this year and also visit my team who are doing outreach and using all the telescopes that I left behind. And Vera, um, uh, I just saw a comment on the chat about possibly su about suggesting that you possibly consider approaching the European Union uh, for partial or all funding or something like that. Yeah, that uh, that would be a good thing to try. Although uh, I should probably look into connections and because uh, they give you know donations, but you have to know the person who you should approach the right people so that can take a little while and yes the european union gives a lot of donations in kosovo and they have helped ever since the war ended also the united nations has various branches unesco and so forth and so forth i would suggest that you explore who to talk to as far as a possible contact within the united nations you certainly deserve that and also look into grant writing. Who's going to be running the operation if you're working in an observatory? Is there a team in place or a plan to be in place? Uh, yes, actually, I've got my organization who's, uh, who's actually the board or of the organization running uh, the AOK -OK team right now. So we are a board of 13 uh, participants. Mm -hmm. Who right now I am over here in the United States, but I'm daily in touch with them, and they're monitoring all the activities that are happening in schools and also in public uh, uh, places that they're doing all the observing. So when the observatory and the planetarium is going to be built, of course they're also going to monitor the building. Once two more, they get, once two more they get started up. with construction, no. from the time they dig dirt uh you know break dirt what do you foresee is how long it would take to complete the facility it would take probably about six months uh also depends at what season do you start because usually the winters are quite nasty in kosovo so if you start in spring then we would be able to move in by september or something like that Primavera, what's the size of the footprint in footage for the observatory itself the building well, actually that i don't remember i have all the architecture i have a folder only dedicated to the observatory because the architecture was made by professional architects and uh, they have all the measurements i just know that the observatory itself is going to be in six meter diameter and the planetarium is going to be nine meters wide i am still not converted into feet so i hope you don't mind that yeah that's 18 feet for the observatory but remember there is also the hall and it's going to be another conference room and it's, it's it's quite big but i can look into it and you know give you the information later something you might want to suggest to the board is to keep an eye on local regulate building regulations so that encroaching properties uh, don't shine lights on your property, that they can start to put up some rules that whoever moves there can't interfere with your sight yeah. line in the sky. Right, light pollution. Hopefully you have some sort of local or can institute some local light pollution controls. Not anti-lighting, but the kind of fixtures that point the lighting that they establish downward so that it does not encroach on your facility. Yes, that's, uh, that's something that as we were uh, making this plan, this project, we were all the time in touch with uh, some astronomers here in the United States who are very experienced in 
uh, observatories and building them and how to monitor them afterwards. So they, they made a lot of suggestions as to uh, where to build it, how big to make it, and uh, about the dome and about people who are around and about all the restrictions we should put and also about the planetarium, uh, what dome it should be, and about the sound system that it should not, um, you know, that it should sound good and not reflect the sound. I, I guess you know what I mean. So about the telescope to be isolated from the vibrations of the ground around and so many things that actually I made a list from all the advice that I got from others that have experience with that. So we wanted to make sure that we don't miss every point and then we run into something that would be a problem later on. You should right. stay in touch with Scott Harris. He's here online right now. He is with Fernbank Science Center. He is the planetary geologist over at the local Fernbank Science Center, does the planetary shows. And he does, uh, he's very familiar with their observatory, which is also it's the Fernbank Science Center is exactly like what you're talking about, planetarium and a public observatory. And if Scott knows anything, he knows how to help you with sound control, crowd control, whatever. So Scott Harris. Thank you, Ken. All right, we have any other questions before we continue on? No, we got three passes. Thank her for uh, taking my questions. I, I have a question. Um, I'm wondering uh, what kind of uh, programs besides the outreach, the Kosovo Astronomy Club, uh, do they have a, a, a solar program or a planetary? Thank you. Actually, we're trying to be involved in everything. Since we are the first program, we're trying to uh, involve ourselves in so many programs. So except for the outreach that we do in schools, we mainly do solar astronomy in schools because they are being held during the daytime. So that's a lot easier. But then we also do uh, like planetary sessions during the night. And uh, one of the coolest thing is also the astronomy camps where we get all the children and also young folks. And some of them are just open to anybody who wants to participate. And we go up in the mountains, take the telescopes with us, and we observe like for two nights. And of course, we choose the nights where there is no moon. So we uh, want, you know, to show all the uh, objects to everyone. And recently, we actually are participating in international programs as well. So right now, uh, we are involved with Isaac. So that is for um, uh, the International Asteroid Search Campaign. So we actually formed uh, together a group with my friend Hap Griffin. So Kosovo and United States together in a group. And we're trying to look for new uh, objects that we are being uh, we are having data provided by the uh, pan stars telescopes Hinavai, which is a 1.8 meter wide telescope so we analyze all the data to look for new objects what's out there so that's a good thing because people even though they don't have the equipments uh, in this case us in kosovo we can observe uh, at these things by another telescope by you know data that is being provided to us so we can look and analyze and see and find new objects so that's pretty awesome and you know we're trying to slowly develop other programs but you know without having a center first off uh, it's not so easy to do uh, a lot more that we could probably thank you for your question All right. I want to thank you, Pran, for coming on. That was very informative. And once again, you're an excellent speaker and good luck with uh, your education. Yeah, thank you so much for having me here and sorry for all the connection travel. Hey, no problem. It happens, you know. All right. Who's ready for some door prizes? Yeah. All right. Well, the first one we're going to do um, is the uh, donation from Explore Scientific, the eyepiece. Oh, Jerry, I wonder if you can tell us a little bit about it. It's a uh, 82 degree field of view, 8.8 uh, .8 millimeter 
eyepiece that's argon purge it's completely waterproof uh, scott demonstrates as demonstrated online where you can dunk the thing and clean it and uh it's a very nice eyepiece it's uh i chose this focal length for for lunar and planetary use uh it's a little it's not a you know it's a medium to small uh focal length so that you get good magnification but it's not too small you know if you go down to six or five millimeters and it gets to be a little bit much for your skies it depends on your sky of course right. so i figured 8.8 .8 would be a good compromise and it's got a nice wide field of view what's it weigh, so, what's it weigh? Uh, i'd have to go look it's probably at least half a pound probably so uh, i've got everyone's email address inside this little bag thing here so i'm going to reach and not look and pull out one oh, 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 two of them fell out i'll put that one back and i'll use this one here all right the winner. This winner must be present. No. <laughs> Who is it? Let's read that. You got to no. speak so you're in front. There you go. Alberto something. Alberto. Alberto. Woo. Alberto's our new best friend. Yeah. We shipped to, we shipped to Argentina. <laughs> <laughs> it will be it will be very difficult. <laughs> but you got to come up here. Yeah. Congratulations, Alberto. Congratulations. Um, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. I, I just uh, so Kent or Tim, if you can give send me his address, I already have Alberto's address. Actually, I I need to uh, get his shipping information. If you can write me Alberto at jrh at explorescientific dot com, then uh, then we can get your address and information and get it shipped to you. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Congratulations, Thank you. Congratulations we, Alberto. We're going to look the first, a lot more it is observations. A <laughs> lot more observations. It is the first time that, that I won, <laughs> that I win a, a, a door prize. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> Ken, do you have the information on the Celestron uh, camera? Basically, just what's on the web page, you know, that okay. I wrote up. In, um, as a matter of fact, if you want, I'll, I'll pull it up and read it. Okay. Uh, let's see. Let's see. Okay, the Celestron donation is a five megapixel color sensor with micron digital clarity technology to dramatically reduce image noise levels. I didn't know that there was such a thing. Uh, the software automatically filters out video frames most affected by poor atmospheric conditions, leaving only the sharpest, clearest frames to be stacked and aligned into one high quality image. This leaves you to be able to view and capture live video on your computer. Uh, you can manually adjust the gain, contrast, exposure time, the frame rate, and color saturation using your PC. Uh, the machine aluminum one and a quarter inch adapter barrel with C threads for direct threaded connection to almost any telescope. Yeah. Great. All right. Well, I Drum roll. Reach, reach inside and grab one in the bottom. <laughs> Geologist. Gageologist. Who? Gage, that's an email address. That would be the abbreviation for Georgia. Ah, oh, and that you would be won? you, Scott. Scott won? <laughs> All right. <laughs> Seems surprised, Ken. <laughs> yeah, that was. The... Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Well, congratulations. Thanks. Congratulations. Thanks. And that will do it for this evening. I want to thank everybody on YouTube that attended. You guys are great. <laughs> and I want to thank everybody on Zoom uh, for attending as well and all the participants and the, uh, and the presenters for the conference. Uh, you, made it, you made it quite a success. I'm very happy. How many nothing? did we have? Oh, uh, God. Uh, well, How many did we have on Zoom and on uh, YouTube? Right, uh, well, right now we've got 34 on on uh zoom and we have 
10 currently watching on YouTube. But our subscribers have gone up. We started with 40 yesterday. We have 112 subscribers on our YouTube channel now. So that's a good thing. That's a good thing. So I want to thank everybody for attending. Uh, you've been wonderful. You've been wonderful. And hopefully we'll see you again in person soon. Cast of thousands.